Just as we have done inferential statistics with proportions, we can do many of the same things with means. In fact, we more often are working with means than proportions. So let's answer the question first. How do we find a confidence interval for a mean? Very similar in idea to find a confidence interval for a proportion, but there's one key difference with the means is normally when we do a sample and we have a mean of the sample, we do not know the standard deviation of the population. We only know the standard deviation of the sample, which means the normal distribution will be a little bit too tight or a little bit too small to calculate a reliable confidence interval because we're only estimating the standard deviation of the population with the standard deviation of the sample. So if we have no standard deviation, of the population, we can no longer use the normal distribution. We need a different distribution. And the distribution we will use is called the student's t distribution. Or often, you'll hear it just called the t distribution. The student's t distribution is very similar to the normal distribution, but it allows for greater flexibility as we will use the sample standard deviation to estimate the population standard deviation. And that's never perfect. It's probably close, but it's never perfect. And that's why we need that extra flexibility that the student t distribution gives us, is it allows us to still make a confidence interval with a little bit extra flexibility. And it turns out that, and it makes sense as well, the larger the sample size, the less flexibility is needed. And that makes sense, as if we interview more and more people getting closer and closer to the population, our estimate for the standard deviation is probably going to be more and more accurate. And the more accurate we are, the less flexibility we need. It turns out that we have to adjust the student t distribution then based on the sample size. And we call that estimation the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is often abbreviated df for degrees of freedom. And it's very easily calculated as n minus 1. The degrees of freedom is n minus 1, one less than the sample size. And it turns out that if the sample size is greater than 30, the student t is almost identical to the normal distribution. 
And so when we have a sample size bigger than 30, we end up using normal values because they're so close together. But if the num sample size is less than or equal to 30, then we will use the student t table for finding critical values. This table shows us the amount of area that we're going to get in a single tail of the t distribution. You'll notice the shape looks very similar, but our degrees of freedom are going to determine the critical values that we need to calculate. So what we'll do is we'll first find out the degrees of freedom of our problem. Maybe we've got 11 degrees of freedom. Then we'll figure out how much area we want in one tail. Maybe we want. 1% in one tail. The table would then give us the critical value that we can use to calculate a confidence interval. One more thing you'll notice is the very last row of the table is labeled z, because that's when we pass a sample size of 30 or 30 degrees of freedom. And at that point, the t distribution starts to look like the normal distribution. And you should recognize several of the numbers in this row as the critical values we used with proportions. Those are the z values that give us the area we want in each tail. So once we're past 30 degrees of freedom, we'll just use those normal values. Well, now that we're kind of familiar with this idea of the student t distribution that we have to use if we don't know the population standard deviation, let's talk about how we can use that to make a confidence interval for means. First off, the distribution for the mean, if we don't know the standard deviation, we'll just say is t with a subscript that is the degrees of freedom. And remember, the degrees of freedom is equal to 1 less than the sample size. So that's the distribution we're working with, the t distribution. So we need to calculate an error that exists between the population and the sample mean. That error. We'll do a colon. That error is equal to our t sub alpha over 2, very similar to our z sub alpha over 2, but this time we'll use the t table and the correct number of degrees of freedom, times the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. And once we know the error, we can find the confidence interval. And very similar to proportions, with the confidence interval, we will subtract and add the error to our statistic. So we'll take our x bar and we'll subtract the error to get our low value, and our x bar and we'll add the error to get our high value. And that's the confidence interval using the error we just calculated. These three pieces will work together to get us our confidence interval. So let's try an example. You are interested in the average cost of a smartphone. So you take a sample of 16 smartphones and find a mean cost
of $531 with a standard deviation. of $83. We are going to, number one, construct a 90% confidence interval. A couple things we need to know to conduct this 90% confidence interval. First, our alpha, the amount of area in both tails, if it's a 90% confidence interval, is going to be 0 0.10. So the alpha over 2, looking at just one tail, is half of that, or 0 0.05. For our t distribution, we need to know the number of degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is always 1 less than the sample size. So we've got 16 smartphones minus 1. We have 15 degrees of freedom. And so now we're ready to calculate our t value. That has 0.05 in the tail and 15 degrees of freedom. Going down our degrees of freedom on the table, we want 15 degrees of freedom. And we want 0.05 area in that tail. So we go down and across, and we find a t value of 1.753. 1.753. Now we're ready to calculate the error. The error is that t value, 1.753, times the standard deviation of my sample size, which was $83, divided by the square root of my sample size, which is 16. And putting that on my calculator, we get an error of $36.37. So if that's the maximum error between my sample mean and the population mean, we just have to subtract and add it to my sample mean. The $531 minus the error of $36.37, and the $531 plus the error of $36.37 gives me a 90% confidence interval of $494.63 up to $567.37. And very similar to how we constructed a confidence interval with proportions and then interpreted it, we will also interpret the confidence interval for the means following almost the exact same script. We estimate with 90% confidence the true population, and then state the parameter in context, mean smartphone cost. is between $494.63 and $567.37. So as we can see, constructing a confidence interval with a mean is very similar to how we constructed a confidence interval with a proportion. We've got a different distribution. A slightly different formula for the error, but the exact same idea. So you should be able to try a few of these, and we'll talk about confidence intervals a little bit more in class.